My parents threw me in the sea when I was two, and I floated. They called me Little Fish. My parents trusted the sea. Ilahuna al-Azraq lam na'ud na'buduhu wa ma zilna nuhibbuhu. O oh, blue God, we no longer worship, but still love. لما لا نتذكر البحر إلا عندما تموت العصافير على الشرفات. Welcome to the New Lines podcast. I'm your host Rasha Ilas, and with us today is Lebanese poet Zaina Hashem Bik. She joins us from her home in California to talk about her new collection of poems titled O. Oh. Zaina, welcome. Thank you for having me, Rasha. Absolutely. Well, first, let me start with the uh, little snafu we had over the title of your collection, because I (laughs) am looking at an advanced copy here of your collection, and there's a huge O on it, and I had no idea that was the title, which was why I asked you, what is the title of your upcoming (laughs) book? (laughs) Tell us more about this. Yeah, I, actually, I'd like to, like, I'm going to tell you, and then I'd like to hear your impression, like, of what you thought of the cover, like, having not realized that the title was Oz, because that's, that's very interesting for me, like, people who don't know that the title is O and just, inca- like, walking in a bookstore, say, and you're you're walking and you just in- encounter this this cover, so I'm really curious about how, how what your reaction was to the cover, but in, in answer to your question... Um, for the longest time, actually, the, the working title for me was Ode to the Afternoon, which is the title of one of the poems in O. And uh, I, I kind of worked on it for a long time. And then one day I was just staring at the title and I thought, oh, let's just kind of abandon all the other letters and vowels and just keep the O from O to the Afternoon. It was just like a kind of a gut feel like, oh, oh. That's a, that's a better title. And for me, it's many things. Uh, o in itself is striking. It's also an O of pause, an O of surprise, an O of wonder. Uh, it could be, you know, we could, it could be interpreted in so many ways. The circularity of it also interests me very much. I do think that the collection is kind of circular in its, in its th- theme. Like there's no... You know, there's no like, oh, there's an arc and whatever. It's like a circular, you know, it's an ongoing. All the themes are in in all the parts of the book. And also the shape, you know, the shape of the vowel O. I think the body is, the body in like our physical body is is a big theme in this uh, collection. And I feel like, the O exists in our bodies, like the eyes, the nostrils, the mouth, the belly button. The, uh, I don't know if I can say the nipples, the vagina, the asshole on this podcast, but yes, also this. So all of these are, so literally this O exists in our body as well. And I found that, you know, very interesting for me. And O as a vowel is a vowel that exists in so many key themes in, of the book. Love, loss, joy, ode, God, memory, wonder, home. All of these have the O in them. So really lots and lots of things, which of course I didn't think about instantly as I took the decision of, oh, I'm going to call it O, but kind of came later. Of It kept making sense is what I'm saying. So... As I lived more with the O, the O kept making sense for the book. You became the O and the O became you. (laughs) And on and on it went in a circle. Yes, yes. But I would really like to know your reaction to the cover. Like, so you didn't realize it was O, but you saw that huge circle, right? And the hands. So I'm interested. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it didn't even register with me that this was the title. I just thought, oh, there's an O. I think it even registered just unconsciously, you know, which is exactly what you're talking about. The O seems to be so embedded in our subconscious. (laughs) So, you know, so much so, I guess, in my case that, you know, I just thought, oh, 
oh, let me read this book. <laughs> Oh, great. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. <laughs> okay, let's move on to your career as a poet. We can say you've been publishing poetry for over a decade, and you've been writing poetry for probably two decades and more. Um, how did you first discover poetry as a medium for your self-expression? I think I probably discovered poetry before I even knew the term poetry. I think I was just as a child attracted to uh, language and to little moments in which language can be very, very poetic. Um, I I remember having this like um, little agenda that my dad had probably given given to me because it was it was the agenda says 1989 so I was prob so I was I was born in 1981 so I was what eight um he he had probably given it to me because it was 1990 already you know something like that and I just wrote all kinds of stuff and it was back then it was in French and Arabic because I went to the lycée I was French educated I didn't start learning English until the age of 12 that's how it was then they didn't teach you English right away it was only French and Arabic um, until you were in sixth grade so it was this agenda full filled with just lyrics of either poems I learned in class or poems I invented or songs like Feirouz songs or whatever songs I'd been hearing in, in, English, in French or Arabic. And it also, I also kind of made up these kind of, um, what do you call them? The, the things, why is, so English deserts me at time. What do you call the tawabe? What uh, the, the things on the back of the letter? The stamps? The, Thank you very much. Yeah, the postal stamps. <laughs> okay. See, this is what happens when you're speaking in different... So the postal stamps, I used to make them up and kind of, you know, like draw a watermelon and just write underneath it, c'est une pastèque, botticha, you know, just kind of... So there was this interest in language, I think. And I, I love to memorize ads, which is like the furthest thing from poetry. But I, can't, we, I don't know if you remember the ads we had in the 80s, which were very sing-songy, always a song, always... I loved memorizing them, like sabun ads or asat lishtura ads or whatever, you know. But that was all... T this is all to say that language as a medium attracted me as a child right away. You know, and I guess slowly I realized when we began learning poetry at school and you know how they give you a homework like, oh, you have to learn poems. And I remember the first homework. I remember it. I don't remember very well the poem, but I had to memorize this like little you know, rhyme in French. And I remember this joy in terms of, oh, I like this homework. I like memorizing this. And I like singing it. And I and I kind of instinctively sung it in the living room. I remember like kind of going around singing it. So I, I liked that. I liked memorizing poems uh, as a little girl. And I think that's how it all started somehow. That's very interesting because growing up multilingual and you mentioned the ads that you listened to that attracted you, the sing-songiness of it all, uh, learning French before English, growing up speaking Arabic as well, these different languages that have different meters, different rhythm, different rhyme, different, um, different letters, different places in the throat and the mouth. Uh, different placement of the tongue for the letters. How do you reconcile all that as a poet when you do, you know, your bilingual duets? And, and I've seen also French words sprinkled here and there. So I guess trilingual duets or tri triplets. I don't know what you want to call them. <laughs> triplets. Uh, no, I, I think it's, they're bilingual. They're English and Arabic. And... Um... I don't know if the duets are an attempt at uh, reconciliation as much as just saying there's a convo between these two languages that's kind of always in my head and these duets kind of reflect that. They reflect how I speak because I kind of 
jump between languages as I speak, like I just did it now. I forgot the word for stamps and I asked you what does tawabah mean, right? So I don't know if I reconcile. Yeah, let yeah. me interject because I want to explain the idea of the bilingual duet to the listener and basically explain it in your own words when you're, what what is a duet? Yeah, yeah. So the idea of the duet is it's a fully bilingual poem. So it's not, which is what I used to do before, like a poem in English with Arabic words sprinkled or Arabic expressions or whatever. It's fully bilingual. So the Arabic has as much space, if not more, than the English. So on the page, you're seeing the English on the left and the Arabic on the right. And the idea is if you only read English, then you'll have a poem in English. And if you only read Arabic you will have a poem in Arabic. And if you're bilingual, you kind of go across the page reading, threading them through, and hopefully a third dimension or a third poem opens up in this space that is a conversation between these these two languages. And is that, would you say, a metaphor for the bilingual or trilingual or multicultural psyche in that you can think in different languages and sometimes they're not connected just like with the example about the stamp you're thinking of the stamp you can't think of the word in the moment is that does that capture the inner psyche of you know basically two monologues going on side by side interacting at times separating at other times I mean, probably. I'm not a linguist. I think like linguists probably know a lot more about like the bilingual mind and how it operates. But probably, I would say it's it's a reflection. It's a result of that for sure. It's a result of my mind jumping languages for sure. So you were talking about how this is also an attempt for you to reconcile these different languages together. Um, not reconcile. I wouldn't use the word reconcile. Um, I would just say that they're there. They exist in my head and also on the page. And yeah, I don't think it's an attempt at reconciliation as much as maybe conversation. Uh, maybe also taking a look. I, I'm very interested in, but I don't know much about how language affects perception. And so when I was writing the duets, I kind of noticed that, you know, when I write in Arabic, the perceptions, like I'm the same person. It's not like my relationship to Lebanon is going to change if I'm writing in Arabic, but a little bit it does. Like if I'm writing about Lebanon in Arabic, I find myself maybe less forgiving of it than if I were writing in English uh, and yeah, maybe maybe because English is a bit removed. Uh, I I know maybe subconsciously that other people from other cultures are going to read the English, whereas in Arabic, I know the Arabs are going to read this, so I can be like, you know, uh, like no need for content, any context, and just like spiteful if I want to. Or does that make any sense? I mean, I'm still kind of trying to grapple with it, but I think think something along those lines about perception and language and how how if I'm writing in English versus if I'm writing in Arabic about the same thing, it's going to be a slightly different angle. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense to me because in Arabic, you're, you know, you're you're having a conversation with the Arabic speaking audience. And there is so much that you and your Arabic speaking audience know that is unspoken and that can remain unspoken in your poetry. And you can simply build upon that to a new level. Whereas in mm -hmm. English, as you said, you have to include the context. You have to, you know, start from a very different angle. And maybe that in and of itself changes your perception. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, this is not to say that, you know, in uh, when you write about uh, uh, Arab culture or being an Arab woman in English is that you're you're always explaining or contextualizing. Of course not. I mean, po po a poem is a poem and it's just it, I think it has this direct uh, relationship 
with the reader, even though they don't understand, you know, some, so the Arabic, the Arab readers would understand maybe more layers, right? But it doesn't mean that I'm going to have to like, you know, endlessly explain myself to, to, to the English reader, right? But there is this knowingness, there is this almost uh, tawato, what do you call it in, in, in English? Tawato, like with the Arabic, uh, with the Arab reader, right? Like we know. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know what I, yeah. Yes, yeah. What is Tawato, like conspiracy, like conspiring or, I don't know, yeah. Uh, um, it, it'll come to us, it'll come to us. Yeah, like almost a conspiring, like you, like what you said, what you described is that we know, we already know when I say the word Beirut to a Lebanese, خلص, it's, it's, it's very different than when the word Beirut appears to someone who's not Lebanese. They're because we carry our like preconceptions of, of words, even of a single word, differently depending on where, where we come from, right? So it's all very, very interesting to me. Yeah, it's very interesting. So in one of your poems uh, titled Blue, you evoke the Mediterranean Sea very, very beautifully. And there's one stanza in Arabic that, um, that sort of caught my eye And it seems to be a play on words. And it's the, where, when you say, la bahra lana wa la quwwata, which, which, uh -huh. <laughs> oh, you laugh. Okay, well, tell me more. I mean, I have my own perception here of it, but, but let's hear yours. Um, la bahra lana huna wa la quwwa is kind of a pun on la hawla lana wa la quwwa, right? So it means we are powerless. Right, we are powerless, and I in, instead of saying la la hawla, you know, like we don't have any power, where I'm saying la bahra, so there is no, we don't have power, or, and we don't have a sea either, and the whole poem I think is an ode to the Mediterranean Sea in Lebanon, be it in Tripoli where I grew up, or in Beirut where I lived later on, and I have such, I feel that I have such a deep relationship with the sea that I I mean I can't live in a city or a place if it's not by the water like this is how like I grew up with this really close relationship to the Mediterranean but at the same time especially in Beirut I think more so maybe than Tripoli although also in Tripoli because the the sea the like the 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 beaches are very privatized everywhere right But you feel that the sea is there, but it's not that accessible to you at the same time because everything is privatized. And because if you, you know, if you, you probably don't have enough money to kind of rent or own a house that overlooks this goddamn sea, which is everywhere and yet blocked from your vision. Right. So it came from this kind of relationship of like the sea being omnipresent and yet we don't always see it with our eyes, right? So, so we don't, we don't, it's like we don't have a sea, although it is everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with new developments and new buildings rising and mushrooming and blocking a view that you, you had last week, but you no longer have. And yep. that seems to be an ongoing story. And it's, yeah. it's all, yeah, very unfortunate. The Mediterranean Sea, You know, in recent years, um, one could say it's also had an, an added layer of a, a, a profound, uh, sad meaning because it's also been the escape for so many people. Um, I mean, legally or illegally, and I guess not even in the past few years necessarily. Yeah, but... so it, it does take on this whole somber, like it 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 becomes even heavier. And I think after the Beirut explosion as well, the sea took on even a, another layer of, you know, a lot of people said the sea kind of protected us because the explosion was kind of that the sea swallowed a little bit of the explosion and also the silos, right? The, the wheat silos. So it's, there's even another layer after the Beirut explosion. And I was thinking about it actually the other day. Um, I was kind of reading a blue uh, to myself because I'm preparing to um, do the audio recording of O oh, Tomorrow. So um, 
the the poem actually was written quite a few time ago before the Lebanese revolution and before the Beirut explosion and before like you know like really really years and years ago and yet it somehow has all these elements within it already even back then you know so it has it has the the reference of let's burn the tires right let's uh Uh, roll in the tires and light them up and the relationship to the city and all of that, which is um, very interesting. It's as if, yes, the, the revolution happened in 2019 and yes, the explosion happened in 2020, but this hurt, this wound, this, this relationship we have with our cities and our countries and our seas has always been there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Even uh, even at the end of the 19th century, uh, you know, with the great migration from, you know, Ottoman, greater Syria at that time, I mean, it was all through that coast and a lot of it mm. from Beirut uh, onto the Mediterranean. Yeah. Yeah. And even and even in the 2000s, like I keep thinking of so many things when I think of like running away, even in 2006, when Israel bombed and people like there were all these uh, boats, you know, uh, escaping uh, as well to France, to Turkey, to. Uh, so, yeah. So it's uh, it's the escape route. It's, uh, you know, it, I mean, it occupies a, a profound segment of the Lebanese psyche, of Lebanese history, of identity, of the future, of the past and the present, always interchanging. And you capture that with La Bahra Lana Huna Wa La Quwa. Another poem that really sort of caught me, I mean, I love all your poetry. But, you know, I have Thank to pick you. a few. I can't go through every poem as much as I'd love to. But another one, uh, this one titled Daily, which is also a duet in Arabic and English. Kulayom, yes. Yep. And you begin with this stanza. My little country is not enough. Watani sagir la yakfini. And it's so mm. sweet and so sad and so moving, you know, especially in light of all the suffering that we're talking about. Uh, tell us more about, you know, how that poem was inspired in you. This is this is the first duet, actually, I, I ever wrote. Um, and it came to me in Arabic first. So what the 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 jumle, the sentence, what on is came in Arabic first. And I started scribbling Arabic lines. And then I was like, but I but I'm afraid to only write it in Arabic. And also, maybe I can also write in English. And so somehow the duet was born out of writing this particular poem. Um, and I think this particular poem kind of takes a look at, how, you know, my relationship to Lebanon, the how the leaving is really a daily leaving how you know so I've left technically I left Lebanon in 2006 and we were living in the Gulf for the longest time before we moved this year to California but especially living in the Gulf it doesn't feel like you've left Lebanon because you're kind of hopping there every like whenever you want basically it's so close uh it's the same time zone Most of your friends are Arab. Uh, you're speaking Arabic all the time. So you don't feel this this ghurbe that you feel here in the U.S., right? So I think I felt like leaving Lebanon was a daily thing I did every day. And it's as if, you know, when you're in it, so when I, when I was back in Lebanon every summer, I felt that I'd left it. And then when I wasn't physically in it, was outside of it, I felt like, but no, I haven't left it. So this whole, this whole like, you know, relationship of how we carry our countries with us and um, how, you know, some of our countries just kind of spit us out, uh, you know. And, um, and I, and it also, Also, the 
the wanting to leave the country. Like, so yes, the country spits you out and yes, you miss it a lot and you want to go back to it on some level, but on another level, when you were in it, you really, really wanted to leave it and get the hell out of there. Do, do you know? Like all this conflicted, conflicting feelings about it. Sounds like you just described the state of mind of being Lebanese or in the Middle East or Levantine or so many of us, really not just in the region, but so many parts around the world. And it's an unfortunate thing. What are you going to do? You mentioned the word ghurba, which is a really interesting word in Arabic and it has its root, you know, gharb as in West, but uh also sunset it's also gharib as in ooh also sunset i hadn't it hadn't occurred to me yeah right yeah, yeah. gharib uh, gharib strange alien um and you know obviously we but it doesn't have a quite an english translation right like it doesn't like the 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 closest one would be estranged and it's also, it's another duet of mine right estranged gharba um that's the closest thing i would find but it's a particularly like it's particular in its layers in in arabic ghurba yes, you know very much multi-layered so then tell us how you've experienced your ghurba where did you grow up where did you move to and when were the times that ghurba ebbed and flowed within you in the most profound ways and how did it inspire your poetry? Yeah, that's a that's a very very uh, big question. I'm going to attempt to answer it, not and not speak for an hour. <laughs> but I I grew up in Tripoli, Lebanon. This is where uh, I'm from, and uh, I studied there at the French school and. Then I graduated and went to the American University of Beirut, and I lived in Beirut for, I think, six years. And then uh, in 2006, my I got married, and then my husband and I moved to the Gulf. We were in Saudi Arabia, then we were in Bahrain, then for 10 years we were in Dubai. And my first book, actually, the my first book, so I was always kind of writing poetry, but like I didn't have a book project. I didn't necessarily have any uh, plan to publish. But the the thing that got it going was leaving Beirut in 2006 because I was so devastated, especially leaving it to Saudi, which was like a completely different, you know, I felt, I, you know, I couldn't drive. I It, it wasn't very pleasant. So um in 2006, when I left, this is when I felt like I need... I ca All my poems became about Beirut specifically. Also a little bit about Tripoli, but I think Tripoli comes back more in my second book. But my first book was really a love letter to Beirut. Um, and this is when it, when it all started. I felt like something, you know, the city was taken out of, of my chest, you know, like it's it was really, really difficult uh, at first. I think in Dubai it became a bit easier just because uh, I had so many friends there already and I do feel like in some sense people are our homes. So when, when you move somewhere and you have people you've already known, even like my childhood friend that I grew up live, with lived in Dubai, so instantly I became better because, you know, she was there next to me. So... Yeah, and of course it's so. Of course, it translated itself into into all my work. Um, I don't know. I'm always grappling with it. Uh, now moving to the U.S. is a completely different level. I don't. I never felt like I was properly in Gurbe before I came here because, like I said, like I said earlier. Uh, you kind of go back and forth whenever you want to when you're in Dubai. It's it's very easy, really, I mean, to a certain extent. Uh, you know, when the revolution in Lebanon happened, I just kind of packed my bags, left everyone, and, and went down for like a few days because I was like, I had to be there. And it was easy to, to be there. In a, in a certain, but like, if you're in California, if you were in California watching it, uh, especially California, the West Coast. I'm in a different time zone. Um, 
I feel really, really like here I really feel that I've left, you know, and and I felt it that that last summer I went to Lebanon, the summer of 2021. You know, we, we go back, we, we went back to Lebanon every summer, every summer, every summer with, with our kids. July and August would be in Lebanon all the time. And every summer, it's always difficult to say goodbye to the family. But you're fine. You're in Dubai. They come to you. You go to them. No problem. But this particular summer, because I knew I was heading to California after it, it had a very different feeling. It's like I was crying so much on the way to the airport. And even my 11-year-old was crying a lot more than usual. And she asked, will we see them next summer, summer or not? Will we keep coming back that frequently or not? So she, even the kids had a sense of there is something final about this goodbye, about this particular goodbye. Although we, we'd been saying goodbyes for the last 10 years, every summer. But that particular summer, something felt final. Of course, there's the layer of the collapse in Lebanon. There's the layer of the Beirut explosion, which feels like, oh my God, you know, the country's collapsing. And and the reason why we decided to come here is because the plan of going back to Beirut just seemed more and more impossible because that was always the plan, right? Go to Dubai, then come back to Beirut. And I never in my life would have would I have thought that I'd be in in the U.S. Like never. It was never on my like, you know, plans. So I don't know. This is a long winded, very messy um, answer. But I guess the, the short answer is I didn't feel completely estranged until I moved to the U.S. because of like the physical distance and the people around you who have no clue about where you're from most of the time, you know? Yeah, it's interesting. I understand that specific sense of alienation in California. It's beautiful, it's sunny, and you still have that body of water in front of you, but that body of water is an ocean. It's not Uh the Mediterranean. It's very different. And it's, it's, you know, it sort of beckons the memory of the sea, but it's definitely not the sea. Yeah. And also, also like also the trees and the mountains. And like, I remember when I first got to California and we were kind of driving from uh, San Francisco, from the airport, uh, I looked around and I was like, uh, uh, I was looking around the Bay Area and I was like, wow, these mountains resemble Lebanon a little bit. They do, you know, and even my kids again, they were like, oh, mama, you know, the, the mountains, they remind us of Lebanon. Uh, but neater, they said. But neater, but neater <laughs> kind of more yeah. organized. Yeah. yeah. So California, in some sense, I mean, I am grateful that it is particularly California that I moved to now that I have moved to it because of the sun and because of the water and because of the mountains and the trees and because of it almost forces you to disconnect. I was never that disconnected from Lebanon as I am now, I have to admit. And I don't know how I feel about that. Because I just sit there sometimes in my backyard and it's sunny and the weather is beautiful and there's access to weed, right? And you're like, ah, oh, yeah, that, you know, I feel good. But also, but also very, very disconnected from everything I know, you know, so it's, it's very conflicting. Yeah, it's, um, I know. California yeah. does have that effect. It's very interesting. Yet another poem that captivated me from your collection is bulbul and i found it especially intriguing because you know as you know bulbul means songbird but then when i looked it up in the merriam webster dictionary um i mean it's as you know i'm sure it's ubiquitous in arabic and persian poetry and we all grow up listening to you know metaphors about bulbul and poetry about bulbul and if you're very good in at school you want to like memorize your lesson like a bulbul and you want to speak french like bulbul, bulbul. And, and english like bulbul and arabic like bulbul yeah. and everything is about bulbul um but what's interesting <laughs> is that in the merriam webster dictionary they define it as any songbird and they say any gregarious passerine bird from asia or africa that is a huge range of birds. I mean, that's, it could really be any bird. I Anything. mean, we, we think of it as the nightingale, 
you know, I mean, it mm -hmm. is generally the nightingale bird, mm -hmm. but but technically it it can be any number of this, you know, these birds that fall under a wide umbrella of songbird. Um, and and I, yeah, think, I had no idea. For me, bulbul is very, very specific. Very specific you know, like, for yeah, in, yeah. in the language, right, exactly. So, so that's kind of interesting, but it's also, I, th I found, you know, very appropriate to the poem because in the poem you capture that frame of mind of, you know, being multilingual and an immigrant and an exile and growing up in the multicultural household and, and all those experiences. Um, just, and, and we already talked about how you experienced that growing up. Tell us how you you are trying to craft that experience for your children oh for my children i didn't see that coming <laughs> i mean i am i honestly as any mother would tell you we're just out here winging it we're doing our best <laughs> i don't know but like um so yeah so bulbul uh is a poem uh, I don't know if you got that, but, uh, you know, you could read uh, any poem different ways. But for me is the the poem addresses directly the Arabic language. I am talking to the Arabic language. Uh, and I'm saying I've come back to you without letters. Uh, when I recite, I get stuck on the kha. And this this is because the alphabet in Arabic, I used to know it as a little girl, like recite it like in order. And now I really get stuck on the kha. So it's like alif, ba, ta, tha, shim, ha, kha. And I'm like, what's after the kha? So the order of them is completely messed up now in, the, in, in my head. And so... It, and by the way, it began, the, the, the roots of this poem began in Arabic. I wrote it in Arabic years and years and years ago. And it went something like, oh, uh, yeah, That's beautiful. Uh, I'm talking directly to the language. Yes, yes. How, uh, um, and just, then it just became, translate that to English hmm. very, very briefly. Uh, with, uh, uh, so I've come back to you without letters, so forgive me. Yes, and that's beautiful. So, yes. I've come back to you without letters, so forgive me. Um, uh, and so the, the the entire poem grapples with that, the, the coming back to the Arabic and the relationship with the Arabic language, especially in terms of it being, you know, a language of diglossia, which means when we speak uh, in the Lebanese or Syrian or Palestinian dialect is one thing, and then when we have to write and read in like the modern standard Arabic is a completely different thing, almost, you know? So um, it kind of grapples with that. I did grow up with Arabic. Uh, like, I, I wouldn't say I grew up, I grew up uh, only French educated. Arabic was a big part of my education, but I wasn't attracted to it. I wasn't attracted to it in school. I wasn't attracted to the way they taught it. I wasn't attracted to the way Arabic poetry was taught. And I always wanted to kind of run away from it and, and go towards this American education at the American University of Beirut, also to run away from Tripoli and my parents and, you know, live my life in Beirut and get drunk and the stuff. The usual <laughs> youthful angst, yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's this whole relationship that we have with the Arabic language where some of us are afraid of it. Uh, some of us, uh, uh, you know, kind of almost worship it as if it's this divine language, you know, where, you know, I don't think it is. We shouldn't worship any language. Language is a tool and we need to play with it and we need to interact with it. And it needs to be living and not, you know, this stiff, dead language. And this is why the end of the poem, it says... Uh, I'll build a I'll build a temple somewhere else. You know, I'm gonna leave my guilt and build a temple someplace else. But to come back to your uh, how I how I do it with my children, my children were in Dubai, so you know, so far they were in an Arab country uh, up until a few months ago, and they were studying Arabic. Uh, they were not that good at it because I feel the curriculum in Dubai is even worse, is, is a lot worse than the curriculum I grew up with in Lebanon. It was a much stronger curriculum. Uh, but they had it and they know, they know how to read and, but they also have a problem with, but mama, you know, like she would say, Al-Haytu 
instead of al haitu you know so she would say the words in the spoken lebanese and my kids hate uh, they say they hate modern standard arabic and they always say khalas no i talk lebanese let me talk why can't i write in lebanese so they have this thing where they don't like arabic in terms of modern standard arabic i talk to them all the time in arabic and they respond to me in english even when they were in dubai because in dubai everyone comes from everywhere and the like the common language on the playground is english so the french teachers were kind of uh pissed off at the fact that even the french kids were speaking english in and like it's it's a whole thing so there's definitely a loss there's definitely a loss going on from generation to generation and more distance from the arabic language from generation to generation and i promised myself that when as soon as i moved here i'm going to hire an arabic teacher and they're going to continue that curriculum and i didn't hire an arabic teacher yet because you know i've i've moved i needed to get my things going my daughter's been recently diagnosed with diabetes i had to like navigate the whole insurance shit in america so i had so many things on my mind but it is on my to-do list for next year that i do want them i'm going to be the annoying mother who kind of forces them to go to arabic class and their relationship to arabic is not my relationship to arabic definitely and their relationship even further to lebanon is not my relationship to lebanon they don't consider lebanon home they consider dubai home so it's even more of a removal you know for them is dubai is our home and you just removed us from it and we hate you why did you take us to america it's not lebanon lebanon is where they see their grandmas so it's uh, it's it's more and more distance i think across generations yeah and it's interesting it's interesting also because in a place like dubai even if you had stayed there you know they're they're not emirati they will never become emirati and it will never be their country even and they didn't know that as a growing up they didn't know that so my i remember very well having to explain that to aya my little one cuz she was saying i am from dubai and i said but you're not emirati and she said yes i am <laughs> and i said no you're not <laughs> how old was you're she Lebanese. when she was saying that <laughs> very very young very very young you know for her for her people ask you where are you from yeah She answers I'm from Dubai. Type. This is where she's been growing up since she was 0 years old, you know? This is where her, all her friends are or her, you know? So it's 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 a natural answer for a child and we had to explain to them but you're not Emirati. And yes, of course Dubai is your home. Uh but it's not your country. Uh so it's 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 very sad to have to explain this to a child and it's also absurd like why isn't it your country right like you can never as you said you can never get the and actually we had that conversation with them again before we moved here when they were all crying and throwing fits that you know you're why are you moving us away why are you moving us away and i had to explain especially to the 14 year old one that you know lena you know i can't get you know i can't get the dubai nationality the emirati nationality if i stay in dubai uh if your dad loses his job we immediately we only have one month and then we have to leave right so i had to explain all these like residency things that were kind of you know abstract to her and i had to tell her but then you have to explain well how is america better <laughs> than you know and so it's it's really it's 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 a complicated thing but it's very funny that yeah they thought they were from dubai and they are to a certain extent yeah. i mean what what does it mean you're from a country doesn't it mean that you grew up there like yeah e- exactly yeah no it's always fascinating to uh, dive into these subjects with very young ones you know because they still have the innocence and they yeah. actually get us to start thinking and rethinking how we've constructed our world of nations and states and belonging and so on mm-hmm. and visas mm-hmm. and residencies and bureaucracies <laughs> yeah <laughs> all sorts so zena you were going to read some poetry to us oh yeah um so is there is there a particular poem you'd like me to read i mean i was thinking about i don't know is there do you so Yeah. 
Uh, do you have a talab? <laughs> do you yes, have a I do request? have a request. I'd, I'd yes. love to hear blue. Yes, okay, blue. I have it here. It is one of my favorite duets. My, I think it's my personal favorite duet. Yeah, don't tell the other. Duets. Okay, I won't. Yeah. I won't. Our secret. Yeah, our yeah, little yeah. secret. We'll stay yes, here yes. in the recording <laughs> closets <laughs> where we're recording this podcast. Yes, yes. So, so for the listeners, we're both recording from our closets <laughs> in our respective closets. Yes. Yes. One with in our Washington, jackets one in us. California. Exactly, because it's the best place for audio. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is blue azraq. Nara al bahra wala narahu illa fil manam. A patch, a glimpse among the antennas. Aw min bain al ashrita ala al astuh. How to brave this blue? La bahra lana huna wala quwa. Sometimes I forget the sea is this close. لنا حب قديم يريد أن يحفر لك في الإسمنت شاطئا My love, I want to dig a beach for you out of this cement لنا مطر محمل تارة بعطش الأرض وتارة بعفن الشارع O oh, old faith and new O oh, time of wells and time of satellite dishes لنا الحر والرقص على ظهور المباني قد نرى بقعة بحر من هناك Are the fish still edible? Our nets are full of plastic and trash لنا كأس تجري فينا كنبع صغير ننسش فيه سماء وغروبا ونجوما وتراتيلا My parents threw me in the sea when I was two and I floated. They called me little fish. My parents trusted the sea. Ilahuna al-azraq lam na'ud na'buduhu wa ma zilna nuhibbuhu. O blue god we no longer worship but still love. Lima la natadhakkaru al-bahra illa indama tamutu al-asafiru ala al-shurufat. Over breakfast, I had to convince a friend Beirut was still on the Mediterranean. لمن ندون أحلامنا كل صباح? Are you sure, he asked? Is it a deep, bluest blue? ما أجمل الموت بلا ضرائح? Yes, I said. No, I said. ارفعني على كتفيك قبل أن نحرق المدينة. Lift me on your shoulders, roll in the tires, light them up. O oh, city, we no longer love but still worship. لقد أقصمنا أن نقلع عن عبادة هذه المدينة. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. If the Pacific Ocean ever inspires a poem in you, do share it with us right away. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I'm sure, you know, if I stay here, it's bound to, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Can we request an encore? One more? Another, another poem? Yeah. How about we digress completely? I do feel that our convo... Uh, you know, just because uh, we're both uh, Arabs, I guess, uh, really focused on cities and places and ghurbe uh, and estrangement. But I think there's lots more to owe. There's a lot about motherhood. There's a lot about the body and love and just being a woman. And I've been thinking about abortion uh, just because... Um, there, it's been the talk here in America. I mean, I don't really understand uh, America uh, uh, as as much as I should probably, but I hear that there's a like that abortion can be could be in in some states banned soon, and so I want to read a poem 
uh, about that one time I did get an abortion. And, you know, I got I got an abortion in Lebanon, which is a country where, you know, it's it's illegal. But of course, everyone gets that, but not safely, not safely. So I was lucky enough to be safe. And this is a poem about that those feelings and that time and I feel you know it might be a good digression to make absolutely I would love to hear it but I want to clarify in Lebanon it's illegal if it's uh, uh, elective but it's not illegal if it puts if it's if the mother's life is in danger which is actually what some people in this country are pushing to make illegal. oh really yeah even that so it's even yes oh. so there is a push so you know that's just a clarification Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good clarification because you'd think, of course, if it puts the mother in danger, it should be legal. Yeah. yeah. Nobody thinks of yeah. that. Yeah. And doctors yeah. don't go to jail for performing it on a mother. For performing it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, mine was uh, didn't put me in danger. I just didn't want the third child, which is my right and every woman's right. And, you know, uh, they should just get off our backs and our bodies, you know. Like, fuck off. <laughs> All right. This is so I'm going to I have I have the manuscript open. I'm sorry. I'm trying to juggle like recording. And so I'm going to open the manuscript and try to scroll to okay. the poem. The poem is titled Ode to Lipstick. Today you bought new lipstick. You ate dark chocolate, listened to a friend rage about marriage. You saw a newborn in a stroller and weren't moved. You're relieved. Your children's legs don't wrap around your hips anymore. They click their seatbelts into place by themselves. Your older daughter just turned 10 and is learning to send you messages like, keep calm and love mama. She imitates your dance moves in the car. This made you feel a little immortal. The lipstick you bought is called Plum. It smells good. You're learning to love bolder colors on your lips. Red, mauve, fuchsia. You want to go out one day and buy green lipstick. There should be lipstick called to go out one day and buy green lipstick. Or, I rant about marriage with my girlfriends and laugh. Or, I will party tonight. Or, because life is too short. Except, today, life felt long enough for you to go through your old makeup. You gave your daughter the lipsticks she'd broken and told her not to touch the new ones. You threatened. She nodded and smiled at her gift. Life was long enough for you to go out before sunset because you needed tomatoes and the hypnotic light at that time of the day. You only remembered the tomatoes when you opened the fridge and only remembered the beautiful light when you drove through it. The world took slower breaths and you loved it. The way you love your children with an ache when they're sleeping, when the quiet makes you long for the voices you'd silenced in the afternoon. Or the way you whisper to your husband in his sleep that you miss him, ask him to remember the words in the morning, and he doesn't. You talk about marriage. Only a piece of paper, he says. And what he means is, don't be afraid. Us is still here inside all this. Who remembers anything in the morning days? Today, you woke up anticipating the hours, smiling in bed like a child, excited about a trip to the beach. Surprised, you asked, what is it again that I'm happy about? Slowly, you conjured the house the real estate agent showed you, empty, spacious, full of sun and dust. Perhaps you were moved when you saw the child. Perhaps you're saying you don't regret not having the one that had started inside you in December. You took the pills. You bled. You cried. You want an, en an empty uterus and to dance. You want arms strong enough to lift this weight and the new house. 
When asked to put from in a sentence, your daughter wrote, I am from my mother. You've decided you are country enough. The night begins. An airplane blinks in the distance. The old and new loves wait at airports, in homes, on street curbs. You will wear your new lipstick. Call it, look at us, all want and tongue. Your husband will not stand still for a photo. You will rise when a favorite song comes. Wow. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it before we sign off? Yes, sure. So this, I don't really remember how I wrote it. I think it was, it took me long to write it, but um, it was in the aftermath of me having, you know, gotten pregnant and not wanting uh, to have another child. And I was in Dubai back then and I had to travel to Lebanon. And I remember it was around Christmas in December and my kids were young and they were like, why is mommy leaving? And uh Kind of, you know, no one knew why, why I was leaving except myself and a few friends and my husband. And I went to Lebanon to, you know, to get the abortion and and came back. Um, and we also happened to uh, move the summer after that that December to another house. So I'm I was also talking about, you know, moving to a new house moving into a new phase in your life when the children are older, when the marriage is older, when you're talking with your girlfriend and raging about marriage. And when you're, as a mother, I think, finding yourself again away from your kids uh, because it could eat you up, motherhood, uh, when they're very, very young and need you all the time. And of course, you know, you had them and you have that responsibility to take care of them, but you could lose yourself inside it. So I remember having this guttural rea reaction of absolutely not, not, not another child. Like, no, no, no. Uh, because I was just beginning to come back to, to myself. Um, so, yeah, it's, that's, that's how it came about, I guess. Wow. Zena, I could have a conversation with you for hours and hours, but I know you have <laughs> to you. pick up your children from school and you have <laughs> other better things to do. It was such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. It was really a pleasure talking to you. It felt like just, a, it didn't feel like an interview, honestly. It just felt like a, you know. Like old friends really... chatting. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Zena Hashem-Bake, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Russell.